So we really do like your book. People should buy your book. They should read it. I like the part about the Sankey diagrams and, and uh, your very impressive, very detailed Sankey of the U.S. economy. Maybe you could tell our audience about that. A Sankey diagram is sometimes called a spaghetti chart. It's a good way of mapping the flow of stuff. And I'm a huge fan of Sankey charts. I've looked at a lot. In the case of energy, what it does is it tracks the flow of energy from where we get it, which is called primary energy, which might be coal or natural gas in the case of fossil fuels, or it could even be hydroelectricity or solar or wind. And then how that energy flows through in the case of you know coal, for example, through a power plant, how much of that is lost as waste heat, how much of it becomes electricity, how much of that electricity is lost when it's being transmitted across the countryside, then how much of that electricity is used in lighting versus used in heating versus used in driving vehicles. And then I basically do that sort of following those traces for every single energy source as much as possible. And it actually makes quite beautiful charts. In fact, I, I was so enamored that we took all the numbers out and just showed the um, the flows themselves in the end papers of the book. And the publisher was kind enough to entertain my book fetishism and so they, they quite, create quite beautiful images but it's also a very useful tool if you're thinking about how do you decarbonize because rather than just thinking oh you know stop coal etc you can actually think about well what do people want to do with the end results of all that energy over on the other side of the chart where the demand is and how do you do all the things that humans like without producing carbon dioxide and really there you go that's the summary of the book big chart explained over 200 and something pages. <laughs> so like if you're going to electrify transportation or uh, home heating, then you got to make sure you're supplying all those uh, heat pumps and EVs with uh, electricity, right? And, and it's got to be renewable electricity. Right. You've got to look upstream and downstream of that. And I think that's hugely important because I think journalists still continue to get a lot of this wrong. In fact, my inbox is flooded with, I won't call them crazy people, but sometimes you might call them angry people. And they're like, oh, but, you know, if you electrify your water heater in your car today, you're really burning coal and natural gas to do it. And that's a little bit true, but it's a very cynical statement that slows things down. We have to not only make the electricity supply clean, but also make all the machines that connect to it clean. And so there's still a lot of Sankey education to be required out there in the economy that, you know, we need to walk and chew gum at the same time. We need to electrify everything and decarbonize the electricity sector. So you mentioned cynicism. And one of my favorite things about your book is the optimism and the kind of reality of it all. And I'm curious how folks are reacting to that. I know you're doing some work on community electrification. And I'm wondering like how regular people who aren't energy nerds are taking in all this information and, and doing practical things with it. So firstly, an admission, as an author, you choose every word in the book, except the title. So Paul Hawken is a friend and he very wisely said, oh, I had some other horrible long title. And he's like, no, no, it's got to be one word. It should be electrify. It's like, all right. And then the publisher chose the subtitle and she suggested Optimus Playbook. And I was like, are you sure you read the book? <laughs> you didn't read the bit about like just what an extraordinary transformation of everything we do this is. And so I pushed back a little bit against Optimus, but I've now come to embrace it. I think I am optimistic. I might say it's a Churchill kind of optimism. You know, they just had their ass handed to them at Dunkirk and looks very grim for England, yet Churchill sort of in, in a, the similar kind of grim optimism, like we must fight them on the beaches, we must fight them in the air. So, you know, it's a wartime cry kind of optimism. We can do it, but it's going to require all of us. Anyway, I am an optimist now. It says so on my book. <laughs> a reluctant optimist. <laughs> I moved to Australia during COVID. There's some interesting things going on down here in the energy space that, that do make it kind of interesting. I, as soon as I arrived in Australia, I wrote a book called The Big Switch, which was basically Electrify was written for a policymaking audience. So I'm sorry to your students for having to read it. The Big Switch was written for the general public. So same sort of material, Sankey flows, but like, what does it mean for you? And in fact, I just finished an essay, which is actually a half a book. It's about 120 page long essay on community electrification and economic renewal. And here's what's extraordinary that's going on in Australia that gives me more optimism, I suspect, than I had when I wrote Electrify. 
rooftop solar in Australia installs on Australian household roofs for less than 80 US cents per watt. In California, my house, it cost $5.80 US per watt to install the solar. So the, the finance cost of the solar of my roof in San Francisco costs more than electricity purchased from PG&E. It costs about 30 cents a kilowatt hour. The finance cost of solar on my rooftop in Australia costs less than three US cents per kilowatt hour. It's literally the cheapest energy delivered retail to a human ever. The difference between Australia and US is not the price of the cells. We use the same cells. It's not the price of the labor. In fact, Australian solar installers get paid a higher prevailing wage than US solar installers. It's that we've eliminated all of the regulatory burden and made it very, very cheap. Now, because of that, there's one state, South Australia, that's like our California in some respects. They've got more than 50% of households with rooftop solar. And across the whole country, it's more than 33%. In the US, it's only one, just gone past 1%. The cost of electricity from the grid here averages about 27 and a half cents per kilowatt hour. So in US cents, 20-ish. 20, you know, so you've got three cent rooftop solar, you've got 20 cent solar from the grid makes a slam dunk everyone's putting a rooftop solar on so in australia everyone has already had a positive experience of climate solutions because they see their energy bills go down once your rooftop solar is that cheap even if you're still buying some from the grid this is not a screed to say everyone should go off grid we absolutely need connectivity to make electrification work but it does mean if we're going to have the lowest cost energy in the future you want to maximize your rooftop solar i do charge an electric car off my rooftop solar here in australia and the cost per mile is under two cents per mile so i'm paying one to two cents per mile at four dollar a gallon gas of last year i don't know what it is now in california but at four dollars a gallon you're paying 20 to 25 cents in a typical car so you can sort of just tell there the economics is extraordinary and for an individual household in my community, they currently spend about 3000 on gasoline. They spend about $1,000 on natural gas, about $1,000 on electricity that's mostly generated from coal. If they go all electric in Australia and they do half of it with rooftop solar and half of it from the grid, their total cost of household energy goes down from somewhere between five and $7,000 to somewhere between two and $3,000. And so the economics here is now a slam dunk in terms of OPEX. The challenge for Australia is, can we afford the capex? Because I think you mentioned it, Bruce, it, you know, it's 40 odd thousand dollars for all the kit. If you're putting the solar on the roof, that's 10 grand. In America, it's 30 grand. If you're putting a battery on the side of the house, it's 10 grand. An electric vehicle is about 10 grand more expensive than the gasoline equivalent. Heat pump water heater is a couple of grand. Heat pump for space heating is probably five to eight grand. So it all adds up. Let me guess, is a mortgage a time machine? I think a mortgage is a time machine. I was getting there. So this is the grand shift to finance from fossil fuels. But there's, I think, something I sort of glanced at but didn't go into enough detail when I rewrote Electrify, which was mortgage is a time machine, is a lot of us don't have access to mortgages, right? People have low credit. They've got low things. Everyone's concerned about taking on a finance burden. So I think it is still what we have to do is finance everything, but we're into the details of it. Anyway, in Australia, Australia is the first country in the world where the economics flip to this is an economic slam dunk. Unfortunately, Australia has the best on the ground conditions and America has the best policy because the IRA, I think, gives on average $14,000 of incentives per household. If you could have the mix of Australian regulations and American federal policy, you'd be in a very good place. And that's really was just my warm up, Jeannie, for your question about community. So... Because the economics work here, and it's not a leap for people to believe because they've had a positive experience of solar, there's a huge appetite. We also live and breathe climate change in Australia. So the most common conversation at the local surf club where I go swimming every morning is, geez, the water is unseasonally warm, isn't it? And everyone's like, well, I guess we might have heated up the atmosphere. The second conversation, for example, last night is, oh, I guess the smoke that's in our eyes is coming from the bushfire up the street. It's like very top of mind that climate change is real. What's so bad about warmer water? Well, warmer ocean water has a lot of problems. So your atmospheric rivers come from warmer ocean water. Our big storms, the heat in the water in the oceans drive all the weather systems. So that causes the more extreme rainfall, the more extreme snow packs. It also kills the coral polyps. It's not good news, <laughs> the warmer water. Anyway, so it's top of mind in our community and I've been able to 
translate that individual household story into a community story. And it actually gets really interesting. And I think this is hopefully the thing that will change climate politics, not just in Australia, but in America and the whole world. And so there you go. That was a long lead in to now begin my answer to you on community. So 4,000 people in our community were all connected under a single zone substation at a place called Wambara. That's actually a very typical piece of a very typical electricity grid, no matter where you are in the world. Um, so big electricity comes in over the transmission network, hits your local substation. It converts down the electricity in Australia's case to 11,000 volts that goes over the local distribution network down what they call strings. And then there's pole top transformers that transform that 11,000 volts into, in Australia's case, 240 volts, in America's case, 110 volts. And then that goes to your houses. So we are actually a convenient case in terms of a community because we are average in terms of the electricity infrastructure that supports us. In that community today, we spend $22 million a year on fossil fuels. There are no jobs really of any substance created in our community from fossil fuels because we don't make coal here. We don't make natural gas here. We don't mine or refine oil here. So we do have one local gas station. We call it petrol. And we spend about $14 million a year on gasoline from that gas station. That creates roughly one job that's also selling cigarettes and you know nicotine and sugar. So it's like three things that can kill you in one place. Where I'm driving at here is our community could technically generate 100% of all of our energy, but that's not probably the best financial way because it would require more batteries than we need. But we should produce 50 to 75% of our own energy with rooftop solar, you know, solar on rooftops and parking spaces. If we were doing that, we'd be keeping, you know, 10 or $12 million of that $14 million in our community every year. We know from typical household consumer spending behaviors, and this is similar in the US, maybe not quite as pronounced, but 55% of all of that extra money you'd save statistically would be spent in your local community as well. And so when you think about it, you know, we're a little city, it's 4,000 households, it's about 10,000 people, there's like 5,500 kids. You think about what happens once a community is saving $12 million a year, and then you think about what that means. That's like an extra classroom or two, that's, you know, a gold-plated bowling club and surf club and a lot of your civil infrastructure, the solar on the church makes the church thrive more. It really is this unbelievable realignment of our economies towards local economies. This is the opportunity that I think is extraordinary and it's good storytelling and it gives people reason to be optimistic about the future and, and this sort of clean electrification. So it's the fact that we're reorienting our energy economy away from something that's a tax on your community because your hard earned dollars immediately leave to something that's a huge benefit for your community because you're now retaining so much more money and spending it locally. So I actually think Figuring out how to tell that story is hugely important. That was the topic of my 100-page essay here. I hope to do a similar sort of thing and similar sort of analysis for American communities. But I think in a time of inflationary pressures, cost of living problems in the US, being able to show that the solutions for climate change turns out also happen to be the solutions to your community malaise, um, I think is a really powerful message. So is that essay that you referred to available now? It'll come out in a funny little publication called The Quarterly Essay. I mean, it's written in Australianese, so I think it's going to be a struggle for some American to read. But... 